Hey guys, Caitlin here. And for this week's YouTube video, I wanted to talk about fractures in the emergency department. So when it comes to emergencies and fractures, there are three things that kind of um, stick out of my mind in terms of emergency fractures. And one of them is open fractures. So that means that there is a fracture and concomitant open skin wound nearby. Um, another one is subluxations or dislocations, and the last one is any fracture with neurovascular compromise. Um, and just a little bit about open fractures. Um, with these fractures, the main complication is osteomyelitis. So you're going to want to irrigate these wounds. You're going to want to give them a tetanus shot if it hasn't been updated in the last five years. And then you're going to want to start them on IV antibiotics. Um, a good timeline is less than six hours from the injury. And a good place to start with this is IV ANSEF. So obviously the main workup that you're going to want to do is get radiographs of whatever fracture you are clinically concerned for, but there are some fractures that do not show up on x-rays. Um, and usually this is initially, um, and a lot of those can be the scaphoid fracture. So that's that fracture in the snuff box area um, between the longus and brevis um, extensor pollicis. Um, these do not show up on x-ray initially, so you're going to want to get serial x-rays and treat it like a fracture until then. Another one is a fracture of the radial head, so right in the elbow area. And the last one I think about are um, metatarsal fractures, so like stress fractures, especially in runners. So this is that snuff box syndrome I was talking about before. You can find this area of tenderness right in between the extensor longus and brevis, pollicis longus and brevis of the thumb. So if anyone has tenderness in this area, they can have an underlying fracture like this one. But like I mentioned before, 10% um, of these fractures are not always seen on the first radiograph you obtain. So if anyone has tenderness in this, in this area and they're not showing it on x-ray, make sure these patients follow up with an orthopedist in about a week and get serial x-rays to look for a possible fracture because fractures in the scaphoid bone of the wrist are at risk to having a vascular necrosis. Now, this is an example of a radial head fracture. Um, you can definitely see the radial head fracture in this x-ray and that's um, pointed out with the red arrow, but sometimes you do not see the radial head fracture and you only see the anterior sail sign which is pointed out on the anterior side of the humerus, and that's that hypodense triangular area. And then sometimes you will see the posterior fat pad sign, both indications that there is a radial head fracture. Also, when it comes to radiographic images of fractures, please don't forget to use your clinical judgment. Um, and sometimes you will be highly suspicious for a fracture and the x-ray doesn't show it, but you are thinking, wow, maybe the x-ray just didn't show it this time. So um, a couple of clues, if the patient has severe tenderness to palpation in one particular spot, um, they have pain with weight bearing, or they have pain with passive range of motion, then be highly suspicious of an occult fracture. Also, when it comes to clinical clues, um, be highly suspicious of an SC joint dislocation or fracture when a patient is complaining of dysphagia. So if they're having difficulty swallowing, you don't know why, SC joint displacements go back into the mediastinum and sometimes create some um, dysphagia. So that is a random pearl for SC joint displacements. A little tidbit about Salter-Harris classification fractures. These are fractures that go through the epiphyseal plate in children. So children in the epiphyseal plate, it's a little softer, it's more likely to become fractured. And we like to rate these fractures on the Salter-Harris classifications. Um, and remembering where the fracture actually occurs, you want to remember what has actually been broken off. So let's take a look at the picture. So this is a picture of all the Salter Harris fractures. So I like to look at them and I really just say type one is S. So that is a fracture straight through the epiphyseal plate. Type two is a fracture above the epiphyseal plate. Type three is a fracture lower than the epiphyseal plate. And type 
four is a fracture through the pip steel plate, and type five is a crush injury or compression injury of the pip steel plate. So this is an example of a type two Salter Harris fracture of the finger. So you can see here the fracture is above the pip steel plate. And seen here is a type three fracture, and the fracture is seen with the arrow, and it is below, so lower than the epiphyseal plate. And as you can see here, this is a type four salta Harris fracture going through the epiphyseal plate. You can see this by the red line. So just some pearls with salta Harris um, fractures. The higher the classification, the worse the prognosis. So. Type 1 will have the best prognosis, and type 5 has the worst. Um, type 2 is the most common. Type 1 and 2 are usually managed non-operatively, and types 3 through 5 are usually managed operatively. And that's it, guys. Thanks for listening. Fractures can be very complicated, and there's many different types and many different treatment and rules to remember with them, and those you will learn with time. But I hope you enjoyed some of the pearls and pathognomics of this lecture and just remember that um, x-rays don't always show the fracture so use your clinical judgment um, and go from there. Thanks for listening guys. See you next week.